Now, one aspect of Unica Longs for Excellence involves helping University of Calabria faculty members to find more effective ways of teaching, meaning methodology. So one line of education research that we are carrying out here at UNICAL is to merge together research from cognitive neuroscience, pedagogy and didactics towards the design of instructional materials which facilitate the learning of complex content like that at the university level. Now, for example, one notion we know about how the brain learns or not is related to attention span. Now, research has shown that when we listen to lectures about something that is new to us, our attention starts to decline around 10 to 12 minutes into the lecture. So, a lecture that lasts 45 to 50 minutes probably is not very conducive to learning. Now, this is actually not very surprising if we consider the limits of working memory. Because now, working memory sits at the interface between sensory input from the outside world and what we call long-term memory. Long-term memory is where all the memories from our life experiences and our knowledge is stored. And of course, long-term memory, the student's long-term memory, is where we teachers want everything to go. However, there's a problem. And the problem is this. All incoming information must first pass through working memory. Now, long-term memory seems to have infinite capacity to store an infinite amount of information. On the contrary, working memory is very, very limited. For example, it cannot easily process unknown information if it's very long. And it is limited in capacity. And also, it cannot remember information for more than a few seconds because it's limited in duration. And it's also very volatile. But if we do something to understand the unknown input, then it can become a new piece of knowledge that we understand and we store in long-term memory. When information is successfully stored in long-term memory, it then becomes a resource which we can then use to understand more new information. The challenge for teachers is that there's so much information we want to teach, and we often lecture to provide students with a stream of new information. Now, when we hear information which is already familiar, we can, of course, be attentive to it and easily understand it. But if the incoming information is unfamiliar, our brain goes offline and searches within long-term memory for knowledge that can help it make sense of this new, unfamiliar information. And while working memory is offline and searching within long-term memory, it is not hearing any incoming information. And this offline processing happens unconsciously, of course. So imagine that a teacher has prepared a perfectly coherent, excellent explanation about a complex concept from sentence one to sentence 36 here. So the teacher starts explaining. The student understands sentence one, no problem. But if sentence two contains information which is unfamiliar to the student, the student's working memory goes offline, unconsciously searches within long-term memory for knowledge to help interpret this unfamiliar input. And while it goes offline to understand sentence two, he is not hearing anything after sentence two. Now, since our brain is really good at giving meaning to input as quickly as possible, whether it's right or wrong, it gives it meaning, it takes just a few seconds to, under to give some meaning to sentence two. So the student's brain is happy that now it has understood sentence two and returns to the classroom. And of course, the teacher has continued speaking. And in those few seconds of time that the student's working memory was trying to understand sentence two, the teacher now, blah, 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 is now speaking about sentence six. 
which also contains unfamiliar information. So once again, the student's working memory goes back to try and understand sentence six. And then when it comes back, the teacher's talking about sentence 11. And the student has missed out on seven, eight, nine, 10. This goes on and on. So as you can see, an originally excellent and coherent explanation that an excellent teacher has prepared to share with her students is no longer very coherent and might become less and less coherent for the students as the lesson progresses. By the 10th minute of a lecture, the student's brain will probably be struggling to understand and probably suffering what we call working memory overload. Now one way forward would be to prepare a blended lesson, intercalating teacher-fronted lecturing with tasks that students work together to complete. However, before I speak about that, let me mention another issue which is very difficult for us who teach complex content. We can all understand that complex discipline-specific content is embedded in discipline-specific language, which is also complex. Now, since members within each discipline community need to communicate with each other efficiently and effectively with minimum risk of misunderstandings, every disciplinary community has, over time, developed a disciplinary way of languaging about shared community knowledge. This way of languaging about discipline-specific knowledge is what we call disciplinary discourse. Now, many think that the idea of discipline-specific language simply means terminology, but that is not enough. Here's an analogy. Here's a pile of bricks. These are words. Even if these bricks are nicely stacked, they do not make a house. So, discourse is structured language and is essentially for structuring knowledge. That is why disciplinary discourse is the way every professional community of experts use language to construct discipline-specific knowledge. And that is also why we must make sure that students who graduate from our professional discipline are able to communicate in professionally accepted ways using disciplinary discourse. For subject teachers, the challenge is to help their students master this disciplinary way of using language to construct disciplinary knowledge. If a chemist doesn't help her students write and speak like a chemist, who will? At the same time, we are subject teachers, not language teachers. So returning to the idea of intercalating lectures and tasks. When I think about the numerous concepts I had to teach, when I taught neuroanatomy, neurophysiology in medical school, lecturing is inevitable. We cannot avoid lecturing. However, imagine that we lecture, but for no more than eight to 10 minutes at a time. So before working memory is overloaded, we stop lecturing and provide students some tasks that they complete together. Now imagine that we design these tasks to achieve three objectives. One, the task prompts students to collaboratively review the concepts that we have just explained. Two, the tasks move content learning one step forward. Three, and very importantly, we design these tasks to build students' disciplinary discourse. So we use the tasks to teach the students how they should speak and write about these concepts in discipline-appropriate ways. So methodologically, we reduce teacher talk time and increase student task time, which means we have much more active and interactive collaborative learning environments. But as importantly, we build students' ability to language about disciplinary knowledge in professional and discipline appropriate ways. So this is one line of education research which is being carried out at the University of Calabria. And in fact, in 2022, a set of our instructional materials for secondary level science education for both students and teacher development placed as one of six finalists alongside National Geographic and BBC. So we at UNICAL are very enthusiastic 
about developing teacher education materials, which, by merging neuroscience, didactics, and pedagogy, help faculty members improve their instructional methods, helping students learn not only complex discipline-specific concepts, but also the complex discipline-specific discourse that students will need to become successful professionals. So stay tuned for more.